This is Season 3 of the Citizen of Heaven Podcast, Episode 106, Parenting. I am Hal Hammonds, and I am a Citizen of Heaven, and your embedded correspondent in Satan's world. Thanks for checking in this week. Is it possible to rear godly children in an ungodly world? Absolutely. God's people have been doing it for centuries. But we have to do it God's way, no matter what the world may tell us. I'm joined today by Ricky Jenkins, preacher and shepherd for the Campbell Road Church of Christ in Garland, Texas. Also by Phil Robertson, the preacher for the Glen Springs Church of Christ in Gainesville, Florida. Let's start with what I've been preaching. I've been preaching about training children and training parents, too. Ephesians 6.4 reminds parents of their mandate, and Proverbs 22.6 teaches us to have confidence in the results that will follow. But we don't always get the results we want, and God's methods often seem antiquated in our modern world. Has the time come for us to change our approach to biblical parenting? Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Well, I, I would certainly say no. I think the Lord's plan has always been the best plan. It was the same plan that was handed down to the children of Israel uh, in the wilderness is the same plan we need to be following today. Deuteronomy 6, when they come in, when they go out, when they rise up, when they, when, you know, just the whole time you're with your children, you're teaching them and instructing them in the ways of the Lord. And I think more than anything, uh, especially when you're in situations like today with our society and all of its challenges, even just uh, what they now call gender dysphoria, that most people don't even understand the simple basic uh, principle of genetics, male and female, that even more so today, we need to be teaching our children the way of God, that the Lord's plan is his plan because he created us. And I, I just think as a parent, that if you can instill those principles in your children and just make it a constant in their life, you're not only going to give them instruction in the Lord, which ultimately that's what we want uh, as, as Christian parents, but you're going to give them the self-confidence and the assurance of knowing not only who they are, but what they are and where they're headed and what their purpose on earth is all about. When you look at society today, boy, it's a society that is just struggling for any kind of hope and security. And if we don't even know who we are, you can understand why there's so much anger and hostility and frustration in the world. So as a Christian parent, hold fast to the plan that God has given us. Hold fast to his instruction and lean on it even more, even, even more so in seasons of doubt. Instead of walking away from the biblical principle, we need to be walking toward it. And we, we would give more attention to God's plan, not critique it, but embrace it. I think we'd be a whole lot better off. And I think the failure of parents is to walk away from it because they feel like, well, things aren't working. But usually the problem is kind of like technology. It's on the user end, not on the design end. If we're not using it like God intended for us to use it, that's going to be a problem. The other thing I think is when you follow the biblical plan, it helps you be consistent. Being consistent is, is a challenge. But if you're following the biblical plan, your chances to be, be consistent are going to increase. As I look back now, I see the mistakes I made in, in not following it closely enough. And when I didn't, those were the problem areas. And the problems weren't with the kids. The problems were with me. And so when we walk away from it, we don't have a child problem. We have a parent problem. You look at the biblical model, it's the idea that the parents were extremely involved in their children's lives. Look at Jesus, for example. Let's go to the first century. In that day and age, a child grew up in a home where they learned the trade of their parents. They, they didn't have public school to go to, and, and that's not in any way an indictment against public schools. But the first century model was a child would be reared by their parents to learn everything they need to know about life in the home, including their trade. So they were taught their education throughout the day as they worked with the family in the family business. They would go and be a part of the community at the gathering hall, the synagogue, and be, be there with the elders and the other leaders to be instructed in the ways of God in their community. And so what, what a child received on a continual basis 
was constant instruction, constant involvement. So that when that child hit an age in, in their mid teens, per se, let's look at just maybe the life of Jesus, which would have been traditional. By the time he's a teenager, he, he's learned how to communicate. He's learned how to associate. He's learned what he needs to know with respect to any kind of reading and understanding scripture. By 12, he's reading and, and understanding the law. We see that, but he's also learned the trait of his father. He became what he was taught to be by his parents as one who was instrumental, not only in the society that he lived in as a carpenter, but in his home as a brother and a provider for his family. The first time he spoke in his home synagogue, they all went, isn't this Jesus, the carpenter? And what that tells us is that his parents taught him to be who he was. They taught him to understand his identity and his purpose. And so he followed in the family path, if you will. It was kind of the faith of his fathers lived in him. The parents were working together with the children constantly to develop them and help them become who and what they are. And so you, you just see that pattern. You see that pattern. And boy, today, we really got to hold on to it. I was, I was looking at some statistics just over the weekend. Over 18 million children in the United States right now are growing up without a father's influence. That means no biological father, no stepfather, no male in their household. 85% of men who are in prison grew up without a fatherly figure. Now think about that. And then consider this, that right now in New York schools, in a couple of New York schools, Children are being discouraged from using gender references, even for their parents, not to refer to them as mom and dad. What the world is saying is those identities are not needed in the rearing of the children. That's the recipe for disaster. If you don't have a father and a mother heavily involved in a child's life. So you can see that spiral. You, you can see us going down and reaping the whirlwind now from the path that we've chosen. And so if we go back to your original premise, how is our trust in God's way and is his way antiquated? Certainly not. Just look even at it from a statistical point of view, you can see what's happening in society because we are getting farther and farther away from the biblical model. On top of what, what Phil said there, Josh McDowell, I believe it's in the book, The Father Connection that he writes, that when a young girl doesn't have a father, present in her life, she's 60% more likely to commit sexual immorality. Children receive their identity from their father. And by the way, that's the father connection. Fathers, earthly fathers, connect to the heavenly father, and children receive their identity from their father. If their father's not present, or he's negligent, or he's just absentee, they're not receiving the identity. And now then, with, with the uh, philosophy of society, that genders don't matter, that Phil's talking about here, then it's no wonder that identities are confused because they get their identity from their father. And that was God's plan all along. That's why the father has the place in the family that he has. And so if, if we get back to the model where the fathers are the fathers and the fathers are the men of the family, when you say the fathers, the fathers, the fathers, the men, that's not abuse. We're not talking about uh, totalitarian type things in a home. That's not the picture of a father the Bible presents at all. Paul will talk about in uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, as a father nourishes and cherishes and encourages his children. A father nourishes in a different way than the mother does, but a father nourishes. And when that presence is not there, there's a void. It's going to be filled by someone or something. Proverbs chapter 1, he talks about not going in the way of those who try to help you uh, walk in the way of the wicked path. And the point about that is that you're going to belong to somebody. And you're going to find that, that place of belonging. One reason that children join gangs is because they find a sense of belonging. Phil talked about Jesus. I referenced Timothy. His father was a Greek, but it was his mother and his grandmother that helped instill his faith. They took him from a youth to the scriptures. Timothy knew the scriptures. So sometimes if that father is not present or is absentee, even then mothers and grandmothers can have a, make a tremendous difference in the life of a son too. Our identity is not defined from the physical point of view. Our identity is defined from the spiritual point of view. And so you look at the world. The world has abandoned the spiritual side. 
And so it's no wonder they're floundering, trying to find their identity and redefine things. If we get back to the biblical model, and as Phil said in Deuteronomy 6, what we're doing is we're instilling the stories in God. And then we have that place of the family, the father of the family that Phil referred to in that time. Then it helps establish, it helps give a, a solid basis for those children. And you find children who grew up in those homes and you look at children who don't. And you see a big, big difference in how, how they respond and how they feel about themselves. Children that learn the stories and learn who God is and learn about God's people through scripture are much more likely to not only have more stability in their life, but their character is going to be developed because they're developing a relationship with the Lord. And so in our house, just Bible study in and of itself, we didn't rely on all of our children's biblical education to come from the Wednesday night and Sunday Bible studies, although those are important. In our home, we wanted our children to learn about God every day so that they would learn the stories of Abraham, Moses, and, and, and learn the stories of, of the our first century church. And we, we had one situation where I don't know what the deal was, but some questions came up about Ezekiel and it, it just hit me, man, I don't know if I know the minor prophets very well, which prophet was where. And we found a game at the Florida College bookstore that somebody's, some brethren had made and it was the prophets game. And that became a nightly activity for us to sit down and play a board game about the prophets. And it was amazing how enriching that became in our lives and in our children because they learn more about the ways of God. I, I believe more than anything, what I wanted to do as a parent was to teach my children to have a relationship with God, that their relationship with God was the most fundamental relationship there is. We mentioned earlier about just the challenges with society right now and identity. I'm afraid that this passage in Genesis 127 that I'll read for you is going to be one of the most controversial passages over the next few years. And I hope, Lord willing, it doesn't become hate speech, but it's the foundation of not just the family, but of society and the world. Genesis 127. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. I don't know if you noticed, but three times it tells us God created. He created us in his image. He created us with a likeness of his image to share his image. And he created us with a distinct image of our own, a genetic characteristic of our own male and female, again, with that image in mind. That's the basic foundation of not just the family, certainly, but life. And so if you don't start there, if that isn't your foundation, you're building on sand and the house is going to fall. The other thing I would add on, on top of the instruction is the example. Get back to being the biblical example. Many times the failure in the home on the part of the parents is because of their example. They're not living what they profess. Children pick up on it. Children are radars. Man, they'll hone in on our inconsistency. And so it's not just enough that we teach them. We have to show them. But as Phil said, in teaching and in showing, what we're trying to do is build that heart and that character. I wish I had been a smarter and more in tune younger father. Our son was born three days before I was 21. As I got a little bit older and began to mature myself, I realized that the training was not about the corporal part. The training was about instilling a kind of heart and character in them. Right. And then that became incumbent on me to show them that kind of heart and character. I, I remember a story that I, I heard, and this was a true story. This wasn't just a preacher story. Right. Of a young man that began, that uh, was deeply involved in pornography. And when questioned, at the deepest level of his involvement, which basically come down to the point of, as that thing degrades their stages, and the last stage is, uh, is rape and murder. But when questioned, why did he begin that? He said, well, he was looking at his father's magazine. Mm -hmm. And his father was supposed to be a Christian. So if I'm drinking or smoking or looking at pornography, uh, whatever you want to put in the blank there, 
And I'm talking about living pure moral lives. I'm trying to teach them from the Bible what purity is. And they see me living that. They're not going to pay a bit of attention to what I say. They're going to emulate what I do. But what we do and what we say must match. In Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 11, it says, you're known by your behavior, whether you're pure or upright. Jesus said, by their fruit, you shall know them. And so as people who are supposed to be people of God, we too are to be transformed into his image. And we, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to hand these children back to God. God gave them to us. And what we're trying to do is shape their hearts, to give them back. We're trying to shape their hearts. So when we turn them loose on their own, they have that heart of God instilled in them and they can instill that in their children. And that's the domino effect. This thing dominoes. Faith handed down, faith handed down, faith handed down, faith handed down. Well, that's why the Abraham story, Genesis 22, is such a compelling parenting narrative Absolutely. where we think this is just unheard of that Abraham, this great man of faith, would take the epitome of the future that God has given to him, all the promises, and send him back to God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill my hope as a demonstration of my faith. We're sacrificing our children to God, too, in a much less literal way, of course. What God gives to us, we give back to him. We're pushing back against God's parenting the same way that our children are pushing back against our parenting. We, we don't believe this is going to work. When we have the faith in the plan, like Abraham had, you're able to say, I don't necessarily agree or understand this rationale that God is giving me, but I'm going to go this way. And God's going to work it out. If we can instill a basic understanding of who God is and who we are before God, then they have so much better of a chance, you would think, all things being equal, turning out to be God's kind of people. It's, it's not just our children's rebellion we're talking about. It's our rebellion. That's a great point there, Hal. Uh, you know, you look at Abraham, you look at Hannah you know, giving her, her son to the Lord. Uh, you even look at Mary just treasuring in her heart when he says, I must be about my father's business. Well, that applies to all of our children. It applies to all of us. And so if you go back to the biblical foundation in the model, and you just look at Deuteronomy 6, teaching our children to love the Lord their God with all their heart, their mind, their soul, and their strength, teaching them when they rise up, when they lay down, when they go out, when they come in, well, what else is left? It's not just a Sunday, Wednesday thing. It's not just a couple of minutes a day thing. God says in his model plan, it is 100%, 100% of the time, every single day, seven days a week, this is your model. We don't necessarily struggle with the model as much as we struggle with doing it consistently, like Ricky said, or doing it a hundred percent of the time, I couldn't tell you what the hits were on the radio from 1996 to the year 2015. I have no idea those years because all I was hearing was Veggie Tales, children's church songs. That's all we heard. When you have your children in your care, that's your priority. That's who you are. And that becomes your number one role, your number one purpose. And, I'll, and I bet Ricky can speak to this. When I decided to really give myself fully to full-time preaching and be committed to that, one of my greatest fears was saving the world and losing my children. So we made a distinct decision. We were never going to get so involved in everybody else's lives that we didn't take care of our children and we're not as involved in their lives as we should be. So we incorporated them in things that we did. They would go with me to the hospitals to visit. They would go with me to meetings. I had my kids going to a Bible study with me at the Bessemer High Rise uh, in, in Bessemer, Alabama, where every Thursday night we would go to an old folks home and the kids would ride with me and go and be a part of that. All right. They're five, six years old and they would sit right there at a table, maybe do a little work on their own. And I'm studying with all these older folks. And that was our deal together. And part of the fun ride was going over the railroad tracks real fast. And so they would fly up in the back of the car. And then maybe on the way home, we would go get a snack. That just became a part of our life so that they went with us. And what was invariably going to happen every single time on the way home, the kids would either talk about comments that were made in class, sweet things maybe that some of the older ladies said to them, 
or what was discussed. And so it was more or less the kids adapted to our lives, not parents adapting to the kids' life, because I believe the biblical pattern is it's 100% of the time you're a parent, and that becomes your greatest focus, and you want them to grow up in that nurture and the admonition of the Lord. The greatest model of parenting is God. He's called both a father and a mother. And you look how he handled Israel. They didn't always please him. But how did God treat Israel as a father? Like our children sometimes. There were children of Israel who chose to go a different way. They wanted to become like nations. And lo and behold, guess what? They became like them. That's not what God wanted. It broke his heart. What you find out when you have a child is you have now brought into this world someone with a personality and a will of their own. And our challenge is to burn that will out of them and burn our will into them, which is the father's will. Sometimes they exercise that will different than what we want, but they're exercising their free moral agency. Listen, people complain about teenagers. Number one, I think that's a disservice. I think we ought to quit telling teenagers how bad being a teenager is. And we ought to tell teenagers how great being a teenager is, the great opportunities they have as teenagers. Do teenagers have, teenagers have problems? Yeah, just like adults. But what do you want to do? Put them in a box, tape the box up, stick it in the corner until they're 18 years old, then let them out? No, then all you have is someone's been in a box for 18 years. That's delayed in their development. A part of developing is learning how to cope with and solve problems. And that's what God the Father tried to help Israel do. Right. And that's what following his example and the Deuteronomy 6 example is. When they get up for breakfast, you talk to them. When you're playing golf with them, you talk to them. When you come home at night, work in the yard, you talk to them. When you go to bed, you talk to them. I found some of my best conversations with my son on the golf course. Because at home, it was like button heads. But on the golf course, we had golf to distract the head button. And, man, we had some great conversations. Now, my daughter didn't play golf. I had to find something else. One thing my wife was great at and I was extremely poor at is when she would put the kids to bed at night, she'd go upstairs, and she'd talk to them a little bit. And she'd say a prayer with them. I thought they were going to bed. I was just watching TV. <laughs> I was the idiot. <laughs> and guess what? When our grandkids come and they're older, they go to bed, she goes upstairs and talks to them and prays with them. This is what I've been reading. I've been reading The Coddling of the American Mind by Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt. Their contention is that overprotecting children does more harm than good, that it sets them up for failure by robbing them of learning experiences and the experience that comes from them. Clearly, parents have a role in sheltering their children, but can there be too much safety? And if so, how do we know how much risk is too much? I would respond, absolutely. We can definitely shelter our children too much. Now, I, I will say that the world that our children are growing up in now is certainly different than when I was growing up. I mean, growing up in Lubbock, Texas, you could jump on your bike and just ride wherever you wanted to go. And you just knew be home on time for supper. I remember one Sunday, some friends of mine, we jumped on our bikes and we actually rode to Friendship, Texas. We, we, we went on a 10 mile bike ride. That's something that would be unheard of today. I can't imagine parents just allowing kids to take off and just come back that late in the day. But at the same time, I fear that our children are not being challenged and given opportunities to fail in the safety of their home environment, or even to deal with failure. One of the things that we had in our family that was a rule <laughs> was when you go to a, an amusement park and you're tall enough to ride the ride, you're riding it. If it's a roller coaster, guess what? Today you're getting on a roller coaster for the first time. You're tall enough to go on it. And, it, and it's always a fear, but I wanted my children to know that I'm there with them. You are strapped in, you're going to be fine. Learn to face your fears. 
And those kind of fears carry over into you get out of the roller coaster and well, let's say you go to a city, a new city, you're traveling and it's time to go to Bible class. And, you know, how many kids end up sitting in the auditorium with their parents instead of going to class because they're scared or there's an opportunity for a teen weekend or a gathering and they say, well, I don't want to go because I don't know anybody. They're scared of being alone. And, And I want you to think about that. We're talking about church. We're talking about teen gatherings and we're going to allow our kids to use their fear as an excuse not to go to something that's good for them. Go make new friends, learn to face your fears, but more importantly, put them in an environment where they're going to succeed. I'm a camp director. And one of the things that we always do at camp is we challenge the kids to do something they haven't done before. Uh, whether it's getting out on the lake and riding the inner tube behind the boat, which for the first time can be a little scary, jumping off the platform onto a blob and being launched into the air, you know, by somebody else on the blob. Yep, that can be a little scary, but face your fears. Don't say you don't like something until you've tried it. And if we can teach our children in these safety environments where we have our own safety net in place to catch them when they fall, We're going to help them grow and develop because life doesn't always have a safety net and they need to learn what they can and can't do. And they need to be challenged. I believe all of us need to be challenged. I think challenge is good for us. I think one of our big challenges as humans, as we get older and can make some of our own decisions, we make our lives way too comfortable. And comfort has never been good for us. Get out of your comfort zone. Be willing to be challenged. Be willing to do what is uncomfortable. And and generally, it's those situations that help develop your character, your fortitude, and your ability to persevere, especially when the going gets tough. The SEALs have a slogan. When you think you've hit your wall and you've given all that you can, you can still go 40% more. That's the slogan. When you think you have totally spent it all, nope, you still got 40% more that you can do. And ultimately what it is, is you can keep going if you want to. It's in your mind. It's in your mind. Challenge your children to grow and develop. Challenge them to do things that are uncomfortable. Challenge them to face their fears. Kids need to get outside and play. They scrape their knee and bleed just a little bit. I'm not talking about a serious gash. I'm talking about they scrape their knee. Little boys pick their nose and they scratch. They burp. That's what little boys do. Sometimes we want to shelter our children from being who they are. This goes back to that gender identity thing that Phil talked about in the first session. We want everybody to be neutral. I coached my son from the time he was seven to the time he was oh, probably 16 in baseball. I remember starting out, everybody got a participation trophy. Nobody came in first. Nobody won the game. Trust me, those kids know who won the game. They know who won the game. And what we want to do is we want to make everybody the same, whether you won or whether you lost. That's not life. That's not life at all. they are winners and losers in life. And we teach our children that they can't be a winner or a loser, challenging them to excel in something outside themselves. I think it's so important. Yeah, we want to protect our kids. Every parent wants to protect their child. Listen, my son is 45, my daughter's 42. I still want to protect them. Our grandchildren, we still want to protect them. But they have to get out and experience some rough spots because guess what? When they get out in life on their own, there are going to be some rough spots. And they can't face those rough spots and overcome those fears and face those challenges. We're not going to make them stronger. We're going to make vegetables out of them. And I think one of the things we've done today, and this is just a generalization, okay, is we've not let the children be children. We've tried to make them all of an equal kind of thing because that's what we're told we are. There are differences between boys and girls in the way that boys compete and girls compete. Boys are rough. Now, listen, there's some girls that are rough, too. And I'm not saying girls are wimps. Listen, I don't know of a man that's ever had a baby. And if a man ever had a baby, the population would be less. Because we can't stand paying that long. (laughs) Women have an indomitable strength. But that's how God created them. 
And in that, we have our challenges. Well, and you think back to what Jesus was saying to the disciples in John 16 as he's leaving them. In this world, you will have tribulation, but I've overcome the world. Jesus wasn't saying, okay, I'm going to make this so easy for y'all. I want y'all to succeed. I'm going to make it very comfortable. No, Jesus understood that the pathway to success is endurance and enduring tribulation. It gives you a fortitude. It gives you a, a confidence in what you're doing. You look at the first century church. It didn't grow from prosperity and ease. It no. grew from persecution. And it grew from people having to make a determination, this is who I am, and I will press on regardless. I love the words of Paul, I press. I press toward the goal. That's actually my word for the year. I have it on my wristband here, and it's the Greek word dioko for press. The word press also can mean endurance, and more often than not, it's actually translated in the, the New Testament as persecution. I press on regardless. And, and we want our children to learn that and they need to learn it from us. And so if we're coddling them, we're robbing them of some development that they need to learn in the safety of our environment and with us. We need, we need to help them grow. Uh, going back to camp, uh, one, one of the biggest challenges we have at camp is when a kid comes to camp, he is so consumed with his phone. You are not allowed to have a phone. If we catch you with a phone, you're going home. That's just one of the big rules. But kids actually go through withdrawals yeah. without their phones for a while. And, and one of the biggest challenges there is, is the phone has become a babysitter and the phone has become a way out that, as Ricky said earlier, is keeping our children from interacting with one another. And they don't know how to converse with one another, especially boys being able to converse with girls. You go and listen to a bunch of college girls talk about one of their greatest frustration with boys is that boys are so consumed with video games, they don't even know how to talk to a girl and invite a girl out. They're more likely to do it via text than face to face. Isn't that crazy? crazy. And, and God bless many of these girls. I'm not going out with you if you text me with an invitation learn how to converse, but boys and even girls haven't been taught to embrace the challenge of an awkward conversation, to embrace the challenge of making new friends. Well, one of the things that we always did with our kids, whether it was camp, whether it was going to a gospel meeting, whether it was going to just a different place, when we get back in the car, give me two names of two people you met and what you learned about them. You had to do it. You had, I mean, we went to the Southside lectures one year and the kids would want to sit with us. Not going to happen. Sorry. Can't sit here. Go sit with somebody else. Well, I don't know anybody. This is your lucky day. We'll be getting back in the car here in a little bit. Tell me who you know. And it was always great. And they lived through it. That was always the funny thing. Did you survive? Yes. I survived. I, I told you about making our kids ride a roller coaster. Uh, we were on uh, Space Mountain at Disney World. This was my daughter's very first roller coaster. And, and I had pretty much forced her to ride it. And when we were coming through the tunnel at the end where it's all flashing red, da, 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 she looks back at me and she goes, Dad. And I'm like, what? And she goes, I'm still alive. And I'm like, yes, you are. You know, you, you did. You survived it. Same thing when you got back in the car. You survived it. Now, who'd you meet? Tell me what you learned. And really, most of the time, they had to have a great time because they met somebody and got to meet other kids. And now both my kids have a friend base that is so rich. And it was hard when they were young, but we forced them to do what was uncomfortable. Uh, it's not easy as a parent. The easy thing to do is just give them a tablet and say, stay right here and I'll be back in a moment. The hard thing to do is, okay, you got to go over there and you got to meet some people. And when we're done, we're going to talk about it. And then it carries over into sports. One of the greatest challenges for our kids is not being the starter. It's learning to be the good bench warmer, to be the person with the great attitude when you're not getting what you want. Most of the time we want to quit. We want to just, I'm done. How many parents get mad at the coaches instead of saying, Maybe my child isn't good enough. Maybe we need to spend more time playing ball at home and developing those skills 
Maybe it's not the coach. Maybe it is the child. I need to teach my child now how to deal with this adversity. Quitting is never an option. You learn to go on. Don't coddle challenge. And one last thing I would say about that, uh, Hal, is the way to build self-esteem and self-confidence is to face your fears and overcome them. Like the roller coaster he's talking about. Hey, Dad, I did it. I'm still alive. The accomplishment of one thing that is uh, intimidating will enable you to accomplish another thing that's intimidating. That is one of the ways to build self-esteem and self-confidence, to be able to overcome what you feared or overcome that seemingly insurmountable challenge. What you learn as you go through life is those challenges and fears really were nothing. Fear, someone described as false evidence appearing real. And what we do is we magnify that beyond its actual size. Phil started a while ago, it's in the mind. It gets bigger in our mind than it really is. If what we can do is then face those, that builds a self-confidence. That builds a self-esteem in children. Let your children fail. When they need to be picked up, be there to pick them up, but let them get up. If they scrape their knee, that's fine. Build self-confidence and self-esteem in them by helping them overcome and sometimes driving them, as Phil's talking about, sometimes he's saying, you're going to get on the roller coaster. This is what we're going to do. And so, showing to them that you have confidence in them. This will work out. You are confident in this, in this area. You can make this work. When we had Taylor and, and later on when we had Kylie, we had this policy. If they fall down, instead of jumping to their aid, instead of, are you okay? Are you okay? <laughs> instead, we said, uh-oh. Because yeah. we figure if the child is injured, the child would let us know. Yeah. But if there is just the appearance of a problem, the skin knee kind of thing, if we hover, they'll imagine that they're scared. If we act like it's not that big of a deal, then they'll be okay. You let the let Taylor roll off the bed and, and land on her head a couple of times, you realize the children are tougher to break than you think they are. They are. Uh, children children yeah. can manage. They they can get through this if you give them a chance. If you give them a chance to to overcome something would walk the dog three blocks in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma to the, the Brahms ice cream store across the street. And six-year-old Taylor and four-year-old Kylie walked across five lanes of traffic at the red light, of course, and go get their own ice cream with the money that I gave them and walk across. You've never seen kids so excited. Look at what I did. Look at what I did. I walked across the street. It was a controlled environment. It's a safe neighborhood. There's, they're not in any danger. I can see what's going on. I can see the stories, you know. But that sense of accomplishment in this little bitty thing in a six-year-old child yeah. makes all the difference. I really think that that helps them overcome this fear of nothing, this fear just because something different is happening, something unusual is happening. You've got this. You can handle this because yeah. we've trained you to handle this. That's a great point, Hal. And I, I love the way you put it because I don't know how many times our kids heard, you got this. You got this. You got this. And then when they did it, it's like, I did it. <laughs> I, you're right. I, I got it. Uh, getting back to camp and, and camp just a, was always a big part of our lives. You, you had to go to camp. That wasn't an option. You will survive. You got to at least try it. I can't tell you how many parents will contact me and say, hey, uh, I'd, I'd really like for my kid to come to camp, but they won't come without me. So if I can be their counselor, well, that's an automatic no. I mean, that's an automatic, I'm sorry, you can't come to camp, but boy, your kids certainly need to. I don't exactly say it like that, just so <laughs> you know, but, but it's like, okay, this kid needs camp. This kid definitely needs camp. It's a safe environment where the kids can thrive, but they, they need to get out of that overprotection zone. Prosperity doesn't teach, adversity does. And generally adversity is just going to reveal what's already inside us, the character inside us. And if you just kind of look back over the last year, this last year has revealed a lot about people. Yes. Lord willing, all of us, regardless of our age, parent or child, should be able to look back over this year and go, man, this year has taught me something. I have persevered. I have endured this adversity. And boy, have I not learned some things about myself and I've learned some things that I needed to be more mindful of. And this has been good for me. Not preferred, 
but there was a goodness in what it taught me. Because it's just like Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. I've overcome the world. In other words, follow me. You can too. I'll show you how to overcome this world. You know, the people in Hebrews 11 are Hebrews 11 because they didn't walk away from the problems. They, by faith, faced the problems. I think one of the things this last year has taught us is uh, we have spent far too much time on the sight part and far too little time on the faith part. We need to put some, some faith in God, especially as this thing is trying to unwind itself here, put our faith in God and get back to the spiritual things. There comes a time in which you have to say, we can't control this, but I know who can. I'm going to put my faith in one that can. And yeah, someone may be hurt. Someone may lose their life. And, 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 and one life is too many. But listen, this world's not our home. And we're not packing bags to stay here. This world's not our home. And everybody in Hebrews 11 faced all that. And ultimately, if you baby your children, you get babies. Yep. We become what we're taught sometimes. Yep. That's one of our biggest challenges. We, we need to teach our children, teach them to be producers, not consumers. And especially if you just look at it from the church point of view, being the children of God, God's never coddled us because he wants us to become a producer, not just a consumer. I, we've been studying the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And if you look back to the Sermon on the Mount, it begins with these wonderful beatitudes, the character of kingdom people. And what's the very next thing that God says? I want you to be salt and light to a dark world. I mean, right off the bat, you got a mission. Right off the bat, you've got a calling. Right off the bat, you have one of the greatest challenges there is to salt and light a world that desperately needs a godly influence. And who were these people? They were villagers from the Galilee of the Gentiles. <laughs> what an interesting name for a region, Galilee of the Gentiles. It was a region of nothing more than you might say misfits or a conglomeration of Gentile and Jew. They were not the cream of the crop of society. They were just simply villagers. They were sinners who had just started following this new rabbi. And right off the bat, he says, I have a responsibility for you. Isn't that interesting? I called you to be producers, not consumers. I'm not coddling you. And I tell you what, if you read the Sermon on the Mount, it does offer a lot of assurance and hope, but it ain't easy. No. And it's not an easy sermon. And it challenges you from the inside out and in all that you do. And, and that's what Jesus is telling us. In this world, you'll have tribulation, but I've overcome the world. Here's how you do it. That's right. Here's how you do it. This is what I've been playing. I've been playing Michael Strogoff, a game based on a Jules Verne novel. Players try to make their way across Russia to deliver a message to the Tsar. They get tired. They find little support. They are attacked by bears. They are blinded by enemies. And opposing forces will overrun the capital if too much time passes. It's very easy to lose, and I usually do. Parenting feels like that to me sometimes. Everything in the world is trying to subvert our good efforts, and success stories seem all too rare. What kind of aid can we offer to parents that keeps them from growing weary and well-doing? Well, I, I would say uh, the first thing, <laughs> uh, open up your eyes. Uh, I, I know that there's a lot of things out there trying to sub subvert uh, our good efforts, uh, and it may appear that success stories are rare, but boy, when you open your eyes, I see a lot a lot of great kids out there. Yeah. I see a lot of great families out there. I'm not just one of these perpetual optimists. I am a firm believer that right now what we're seeing in many churches, we're seeing a resurgence of spirituality in our children and in our families. And I think it's great. And I would say when you're growing weary, that you're no different than every other parent who's ever been parenting. Don't look at the darkness look at the light and look around you. There are some great kids and great families out there. We need to run to those parents who were successful parents and get all the knowledge that we can from them. Uh, if you go back to Deuteronomy 6 is what we talked about earlier. It wasn't just parents who were to teach their children. You teach your children, 
and your children's children. There's a village here, and boy, in the church, there are numerous wonderful parents. Go sit with them, talk to them, get their wisdom, get their insight, learn from them. Challenge yourself to maybe read some good parenting books and and don't grow weary in well-doing, but recognize that there's a lot of goodness out there. I mean, you just talk about the camp. I've been talking about camps. I, I know I'm addicted to the whole concept of camps, but there are so many kids going to camps right now that are involved and they're, they're going to Bible camps. I mean, think about it. They're not going to band camp or just football camp. Those camps certainly have their place, but they're going to camps where there's a spiritual focus and these are all over the place and they're growing in number. Uh, there's more teen weekends going on now than, than there have been in the last 20 years. In fact, I, we didn't even have those growing up. Mark Roberts, they, <laughs> the West Side Church there in Irving has the teen lectures every year. What a name for an event for teens, teen lectures. I gave Mark so much trouble. Lectures, you're calling this lectures? Oh my word. Just beat me over the head with a hammer. You think a kid's going to want to go to a lectureship? Well, yeah, they do. And they turn out in the hundreds to those events. Ricky at his place there at Campbell Road, they've started a teen weekend. It draws hundreds from all over the Metroplex. These events are out there. These kids are out there. These families are are out there. Get involved in those events. Make them a part of your life, not an option or a convenience if everything just works out on the calendar. No, make it a priority. And it's these environments that will rekindle that fire within you. When you're around these other parents and these other kids, I I think to me personally, that that's what we need to really be focused on more. Uh, especially as parents. There is some strength that comes from numbers. I get to preach before nearly 200 kids every week. I know I'm prejudiced for this work, but we have some great families here. Sometimes we tend to have the Elijah syndrome. I and I only (laughs) am alive. And the Lord said, lift lift up your eyes. There's 7,000 that haven't bowed their knee to Baal. When I travel the country uh, in, in meetings, I see a lot of great families. I see a lot of great children. Are there struggles that with being a child? Are there struggles with being a parent? Yeah. But there's no return address when these children come. And so when you decide to have children, you accept the responsibility. And I tell people, you don't have to have children if you don't want to get a dog. Because you can put the dog in the kennel. But you, if you have children, you have to invest yourself in them. And investing sometimes has ups and downs. But overall, in the investment, you are going to gain. I think a big thing that, that helps parents that this kind of plays off the coddling thing a little bit is boundaries. We innocently diminish the boundaries thinking what we're doing is we're helping the child when really what we're doing is emotionally stymieing the child. Boundaries help establish the children and their security. And they, they bloom when they feel secure. When we give into the boundaries, just because we think, okay, well, I don't want to tell them no this time. Well, listen, there's a time to say no and a time to say yes. He talked about grandparents. This last summer, we had some of our grandkids staying with us. And the the question about dancing came up. And I took the three oldest kids and we studied dancing and social drinking together. Nana took the two youngest ones upstairs and she did some kind of Bible thing with them. And so you have those opportunities. A moment ago, I said, we didn't leave our children anywhere. Uh, What I would say is that parents do, I'm going to sound contradictory here. Parents do need a break. Listen. It's okay for someone to babysit your children or not while you go out to a nice restaurant. If parents don't invest time in themselves and they wear themselves out because they're not investing time in themselves, then they're not going to be sharp for their children. I, I just think this defeatist attitude is, is defeating us. It's just tearing us up. And by the way, we're buying into the world when we do that. That's Satan's lie. And we're letting Satan direct and lead us. We're letting the spirit of Satan rule us, not the spirit of God. I think there is a defeatist attitude that we have to be very careful of as brethren. We feel defeated in so many ways. I mean, how many times have we said, oh, it's the worst that it's ever been. Oh, when I was growing up, oh, my, we had this woe is me. You know, I, I gave you some statistics a little earlier. Well, yeah, but it's been worse. It it's actually been a lot it's not the worse. worse it's ever been. 
It, this is not the worst it's ever been. There's a proverb in Proverbs 20, verse 7, that's still true today. Don't put your trust in horses and chariots. Put your trust in the name of the Lord God. Those who trust in the horses and chariot will fail, but those who trust in the Lord will rise and stand upright. We got to recognize yeah. The talk about Psalm 20, 20 and verse 7. I'm right? sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Psalm. I, I, forgive me. I said Proverbs. Psalms 20. Uh, Psalms 20 verses 7 and 8. And, and it's, the, it's the principle of horses and chariots. And we're falling victim to that big time. Uh, my fear is too many of our parents have been so consumed by politics that they think whoever's sitting in an office is going to determine their prosperity or their happiness. That's baloney. Now, I have certainly had my preferences. But the church thrived in the first century with a Caesar who was far from godly. There were later Caesars who actually put their horses in the Senate. There were Caesars who literally abused children and there was no repercussion. It was a wicked world, yet Christian homes thrive. We need to be the bearers of hope. We need to be the bearers of faith and pass that down to our children. One of the things that we would do with our kids is we would make sure they were around other great godly mentors and influences. Because I knew as my children got older and got through their teens, they've heard me a million times. I'm a broken record. I need you around some deacons and deacons' wives or other great godly Christians who are really into it and really great servants and who hold our same values, I want you around them because they're going to start listening to them even maybe more so than you. And it's going to have a great impact on them. Not that you've lost your influence as a parent, but you've got some reinforcement there to help you. Use those resources. Reach out to them. Don't put your faith in society and the horses and chariots. Yeah. Look back to where we began. Get your faith back in God. And your kids will be fine. They'll be fine. We'll all be fine. But quit listening to Satan and yeah. Satan's lies. We've listened to him long enough. And it's time we listen to God for a change because we, we have learned that Satan's way is a disaster. That's a great revelation, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Let's, let's get back to God's way. Well, it's the helmet of salvation, isn't it, Ricky? Yes, the, it is. The helmet of salvation. Yes. That, that, that helmet guards your mind. Our greatest battleground is not in government. <laughs> it's not in the schools. Our greatest battleground is what's going on in our own mind. And, and we can't allow those doubts and those fears to conquer us. We, we need to put our trust in the Lord. I, I'd have loved to have been, you know, back in first Kings with Elisha and his servant and, and the, you know, they're surrounded by all the Assyrians and, and, you know, you can just see the prophet kind of sitting there on the front porch, maybe whittling at a stick, you know, his servants just wet in his pants, all excited. He goes, dude, they're surrounded, surrounded. He goes, Lord, would you mind just opening his eyes? Let him see something else. <laughs> what a great story. And then he sees the spiritual yes. host around him. I mean, open your eyes. And sometimes the only way to really see is with your eyes closed. And by the way, we see 2D. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's 3D. And by the way, what Phil just described didn't die with a cross. If by faith we can see 3D, we can see those that are with us are greater than those that are against us. Yeah. But we get so focused on 2D that all we focus on is what's before us. But 3D enables us to see by faith the host of the Lord's army, mm -hmm. still led by Michael, are still working on our behalf. That hasn't quit. That didn't die with the cross. I think that maybe we've seen too many two-hour movies and 30-minute TV shows where the key was having the right two-minute conversation or the right 30-second analogy or whatever and and the problem boom gets fixed and the lights go on and the children are illuminated this is back when parenting was okay to watch in the movies you know maybe that's outdated in current <laughs> hollywood but when i was growing up and the lead to beaver generation before me the idea of parenting was was a quick fix kind of thing and 
at least in the media as it was presented. And in real life, it doesn't work that way. I spent a considerable amount of my parenting time thinking that the key to making sure my children stayed faithful, make sure they stayed off drugs, made sure they married well, made sure that they served society and served God was having the right conversation at a certain point and being really, really good in that conversation. And you come to realize it's not about that. It's about the long process. It's not about the specific circumstances, like the, the 2D, 3D vision that, that Ricky was talking about. It's not about, it doesn't seem to be working right now. My child's getting bad grades right now. My child has a bad boyfriend right now, or whatever it happens to be. You're setting wheels in motion in a long, drawn-out process, an 18-year process, a 30-year process that's supposed to be getting them to the end of the road. And it doesn't always look like you're going the right way sometimes. That's not a good thing. It's not good news, but it's not the end of the world either. You know, we're looking back at my parents and the way that they parented me. The lessons that I learned when I was 12 years old, I didn't realize I was learning. I wasn't applying those things. I wasn't showing development. It became when I was 24, when I was 36, I suddenly realized I was paying attention more than I thought I was back in those days. Dad was doing a better job than I thought he was doing back then. This worked. It's a process that we're engaged in. And if parents can get away from obsessing about how it's working out right now and trusting in God, trusting in the Bible, trusting in this plan that God has laid out for us, and there's nothing wrong with the plan. Allow it to work. Allow God to do things. He does. He works so slowly sometimes, and that drives us crazy. But he does work his plan, and it'll work it in our children too. Well, and it's the idea, and we're going back to it, Deuteronomy 6, teach them diligently. It's not one day. It's not two days. It's not one year. It's not one decade. It's throughout their life. My mom is in her late 70s, and she's still teaching me. And right now she's teaching me how to deal with a great challenge, being uh, alone. My dad passed away a few years ago, and she's showing us all still that consistency of faith and of love. And then now, even with bad health, she's always that chipper, excited. I'm fine. I'm optimistic. I know who I am. I know where I'm going. Great to hear from you. It's, it's that kind of lesson that even now I'm just amazed here I am, I'm 52 years old, and my mom still teaching when she rises up, when she lies down, when she comes in, when she goes out. And what I've also found, too, is my kids teach me. And, <laughs> and one of the greatest joys is, is when one of your kids comes in and says, hey, Dad, I've been studying this verse, and here's something I've seen or send you a text. I was looking at this today, and I'm sitting there, my mind's exploding, going, I've never thought of it that way. That's amazing. Uh, yes, yes, how did, you know, I missed that, or wow, this is kind of the circle of life in a great way from a spiritual point of view. Sure. You know, we're teaching one another and helping one another, and I, I tell you, nothing nothing just re-energizes you more than seeing your kids succeed in some way, but you got to slow down and celebrate the victories. Yeah. They're there. So God bless all the parents out there. Absolutely. You got this. You bet. You got this. Mm -hmm. Parenting isn't yeah. for sissies, but trust me, you got this. You bet. I agree. I agree. Still 100%. And by the way, it's the greatest adventure you'll ever have in life. You've been listening to the citizen of heaven podcast. Thank you for your support. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe through your favorite podcast platform and or on YouTube. Comments, corrections, and suggestions are always welcome. Please feel free to follow me through Facebook, MeWe, Parlor, or Instagram, or check out my webpage, www.halhammonds.com. Until next time, be strong and courageous, fight the good fight of faith, and do all things in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is Hal Hammonds, the Citizen of Heaven, signing off.